I just want to say one word. Um, there was some discussion, you're, you're apologizing a little maybe for not talking about neural nets and so on. Um, and, and so Brenda and I were mostly responsible for, for choosing the speaker with, with students and other faculty. Um, and, and what we had thought about for, for this session was to invite a set of people who are, are probably the best examples of, of people who are working across linguistics and the NLP, machine learning, ACL community. So we wanted this, this to be not just about perceptrons and syntactic structures, but more broadly about ways of, of building connections and, and, and understanding the differences between the work being done in linguistics and, and natural language processing and so on. So um, if, to, to the extent that we can talk more about that sort of thing during this, this session, that'd be great. That sounded close to a question. You want to rephrase that? As a yeah, actually, <laughs> I think that would work, right? Unless, unless Brandon, you had something you wanted to know. Yeah. What are what are what, here, here is, what are what are the barriers to, to better connections between linguistics and, and and the NLP community? And also, what are the what are the the things that we can get by building those bridges? What are the reasons for overcoming those barriers? I, I, some of that's already come up in the talks, but if we could kind of sum up and maybe go a little further with that, I think that would be useful. Yeah. Um, so, go, go first. I mean, I, I get into this on a quarterly basis on Twitter with people, right. um, and one of the things that often comes up in the direction of why is linguistics not better informing NLP is that people say, oh, well, I, you know, I looked at the linguistics classes and none of them were approachable to me, and so I can't. And um, and so my answer is, well, OK, I wrote a book for you. But also, um, go talk to people. Go build the collaboration. So I think one big venue is events like this one, and I think also the Build It, Break It um, task, and others that actually bring people together as a, to catalyze collaborations. Because I think we do need linguistic expertise and possibly the best way to do it is, is by actually having a linguist in the discussion, helping to design tasks, helping to do error analysis. And then the why of that is um, thinking about it, the benefits to NLP is better NLP. Yeah. So let, let, me, uh, let, let, let me express a worry about that. Maybe there's a solution to the worry. Um, so the solution might be some kind of matchmaking service between people who <laughs> would be interested in collaborating. Because I think, uh, I, I don't know, I get uh, inquiries frequently from people who would like to recruit me as an NLP person to work on their political science project or their understanding medical records project or something like that. Nobody has time to get interested in everybody else's interesting tasks. Um, and I think it's difficult for people to find people who are willing to collaborate with them on more than just having lunch bases. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I... It's clearly the right thing to do. I mean, I agree, I, I agree with the sentiment. I think sort of related to that, I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe this is sort of obvious, but I, I actually think the main barrier is, is time. Um, and not just in terms of collaboration, you know, with senior people, but I think for students, um, I think, you know, it's they're sort of getting more and more, well, I don't know, actually. Maybe in some ways, maybe with neural networks, there's actually less that you have to know in order to actually get something to work than there was five years ago when you had to know a lot more. But, 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 but I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you need to know on the technical side, um, that is on the, the technical you know, machine learning and mathematics side, but there's also, a, you know, to, to really understand linguistics, there's a lot of technical linguistics things you need to understand as well. Um, you know, and I think people like myself who were lucky enough to sort of start off as a, in my first year of college, basically studying both, you know, I've had a very long time to, to get to that point, but I think a lot of people discover one or both of these fairly late and maybe, you know, as a result, it's, it, it really is hard to, to get both of them, but I don't know if there's a great solution for that. There, there are things, things that, that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say something that connects these two things, and that's that um, in terms of, so, in order to have a collaboration, there has to be a reason for both people involved yep. in collaboration to want to do it, right? Um, but you can't just duplicate one another's ability. And so I guess the one thing I, I found from in practice myself from collaborating with people in other dis disciplines is you actually do have to learn something about their discipline. You actually, and you have to be able to do a little bit of it at least yourself. So before I could start working with people like Brandon, I at least had to get the perceptron update rule to work. I mean, that's, that's very simple, but at least I knew something. And and um, and I think it goes both ways, right? It, it, and 
yeah, so those two things seem to be important to me, having shared interests, having shared goals. And I, I, I'm really, really encouraged by, this is something that's come up a couple times in this workshop, the idea of, of building new tasks with linguists' input seems to me to be a way in which we can be simultaneously hitting the goals of, of linguistic theory and the goals of, of natural language processing. And I'm really encouraged to see that, I mean, in, in Sam's work and, uh, and other work like that, that, that this is, seems to be taking off. And the, the, the work from, from Hopkins and Cotterell and, and, and your group of, of setting up tasks that, that linguists and NLP people find interesting. This seems just like, and, and is this relatively new? I mean, is this something, that, is, this, is this a new trend or? No, well, there's stuff like, you know, the Winograd challenge uh, oh. So, so the, you know, basically other tests uh, to try to break things by uh, showing that they, you know, it's sort of like Chomsky's examples uh, that Tal was talking about. Okay. Uh, so you can do the same thing in semantics. Huh. Um, the, the business of trying to uh, be adversarial is very hot in the machine learning community now, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, where you know every every paper, every other paper at NIPS is about generative adversarial networks, uh, <laughs> where you have two net, one network trying to do the task and the other trying to generate examples to fool it, uh, and it's possible. Uh, that uh, we don't even have to set up tasks if we just train again. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. So, so on this point of um, of interdisciplinary collaboration, I think one one thing that's worth keeping in mind is that I think that the time is right to revisit this sort of computational linguistics as involving both computer science people and linguists because NLP has grown so much in recent years, like the ACL was nearly 2,000 people this year. Um, so there are a lot of people around who are looking for stuff to do and they don't all have to work on the same problems. But, but also I think we should be heartened by the fact that NLP researchers are more and more finding ways to do interdisciplinary collaboration with other disciplines. Mm. So, um, you know, people working with political scientists, with economists, with psychologists, uh, and not just the social sciences. We see people collaborating outside uh, in other areas of computer science, like software engineering. Some of the papers Emily mentioned in her talk uh, were kind of in that vein. So, I, and robotics, and you know, now there's this huge language and vision thing, which which comes up somewhat in Jacob's talk. So, I think um, NLP is opening up more than it used to be, and it's as a field less insular and linguistics should be privileged in you know among the many people we could we could collaborate with in NLP linguistics should be privileged but you're gonna have to fight for people's attention but there are more people you know the yeah. pond is bigger yeah. yeah I mean to, to respond to that if every single NLP research group said oh we need a linguist there probably wouldn't be enough linguists <laughs> or at least not enough willing linguists because the ACL has gotten so big just a general question on this line. So what about you know linguistics coursework for computer science grad students? Because I've noticed lots of the researchers, or at least people who are getting PhDs at a similar time as me, I've noticed people doing linguistically informed work. It's often your linguistic training tends to be rather informal. Maybe this is really biased by the places I've studied or whatever. Um, but we're at the point where like informal training doesn't scale. Like, you know, hundreds of students come in wanting intro to NLP, like you need linguistics courses to train people in it. Um, is this a good model? Should there be everyone be taking linguistics courses? Um, I don't know. Can I, can I just share an anecdote? Uh, uh, um, Jacob and I were skiing <laughs> recently, and, 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 and he told me that, that most of the people in Dan Klein's group go over and um, take syntax at Berkeley. But this isn't always the case for, uh, so this is, I think, a particular instance. And I think it'd be really interesting to have a conversation, I don't know if I think we have a time for it here, but a, a conversation about what the barriers are to having that happen more. Why? The barriers are usually the uh, reluctance of PhD students to take more courses than they have to, and the fact that they're already required to take a lot. Uh, right. I, you know, people here will be interested to know that at Johns Hopkins, when uh, Fred Jelinek was in charge of CLSP, uh, we maintained a pact among the faculty uh, for some years that every, uh, uh, that, that as advisors, we'd make all our PhD students take at least two linguistics courses. Nice. Uh, syntax, semantics, phonology, take any two. And that was a really good thing. So the uh, after Fred passed away, and you know the, the center grew in various ways. Um, I, I think that's uh, that sort of lapsed, but it was a really good thing for creating a culture where yeah. you know people had shared terminology and understood these interests. There's another way of doing it, uh, which is to ensure that those of us who teach NLP courses are including a reasonable amount of linguistics. Which I know Tom can uh, speak to whether who took my class in this uh, can speak to whether I've succeeded in doing that, but. 
Um, uh, there, my, my guess is that some NLP courses are fairly applied. Uh, so, you know, those of us who are up here are uh, from a generation which is, you know, old enough to get invited to give talks like this, but uh, uh, also, you know, old enough that uh, there were fewer NLP courses and a lot less machine learning to know, uh, and so we took linguistics courses. You know, I took. For uh, reason, I was Yeah, well, I took. I got a degree in computer science, but I took a lot more linguistics courses during that because I knew computer science. I took ten linguistics courses. Yeah. Uh, it's, but but it's it's gotten. The problem is the growth of all the fields. Hmm. So we have a question way in the back. Uh, yes, Chicago. So this is just an observation, not really a solution to the problems. Uh, we are hiring, just as an advertisement. So we're hiring a computer visual linguist. Um, so uh, an observation I had is actually among the application files, uh, very few, if not zero, are actually from computer science department. We mostly have computational linguistics from the linguistics department, or a few comes from um, outside programs. But really, we were hoping, so, so the, we were really very open with trying to find a hardcore uh, computational linguist that can help us as linguists to understand what's going on in other fields and what can we learn and maybe what can we sort of help this other field. So that we're trying to really keep our eyes open to find this person that doesn't necessarily sort of a linguist in the traditional sense. But it sort of surprised me, I don't know about my colleagues, that after you get very few uh, applications from the computer science department, just wondering about this culture, like what is uh, sort of the sort of people talk about collaboration campus, but um, what do you see is this sort of psychological distance or it's about maybe salary related or whatever. <laughs> 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 it's crazy, but. Well, I, so I did want to bring, I, we've talked a lot in the last 15 minutes about what sort of NLP should do to be more linguistic, but yes, I, I actually think the other direction is much uh, is equally important, which is what should linguists be doing so they know more machine learning? Because hmm. there are a lot of really fundamental uh, <clears throat> questions that are asked and answered in machine learning that uh, are of crucial interest to the enterprise of linguistics that just are completely underappreciated. Uh, and so, why aren't linguists uh, taking ML classes beyond like data analysis or something like that? Phonologists so are. Should we be changing that? You know, and this is, I think, maybe speaks to, to this question a bit um, of, you know, well, where would we expect to find sort of computational linguists? Right. If they are being trained, maybe you would address your question. Further. It's not like we are fully aware we need expertise in an area to help build the program, but I think the practical question is we don't have a uh, lot of sort of people from that field who are actually. Uh, that's what I'm asking. What was the barrier that such that people are actually not paying attention to jobs like that? So, so I realize that my 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 being on the job market is now you know fairly out of date. <laughs> um, but but actually, as someone who I, I think of myself in some ways as more of a computer scientist than a linguist, although actually my PhD is in linguistics and it was in a linguistics department. Um, but when I went on the job market, I actually was not applying to computer science departments because I wanted a more sort of interdisciplinary view of things. Something that I was surprised by when I actually went to some departments, uh, which were linguistics, was that the, the linguistics departments that I had sort of grown up in were all ones that were very interdisciplinary and very open to computation. Um, and then despite the fact that other places were advertising for computational linguists, I found that when I went there, I did not feel they were actually open to computation. <laughs> um, so there might be one or two people that were, and everyone else I felt like I couldn't have, I, it was very hard for me to have a conversation with them. Um, so I do think that that may be part of it, and I, I think things have changed since then. I think many more departments now are you know, have have a stronger computational or at least empirical focus than they did at that point. Um, but I do think that's part of it. I also think, to be perfectly honest, you know, part of it is just, you know, even in computer science departments, it's hard to hire NLP people. I mean, there's a huge demand. Um, and so if there's gonna be any sort of question of, you know, oh, I'm probably going to get 10 job offers and I could go get a job at Google, you know, why bother applying to a linguistics department if I think there's going to be more of a communication gap? Um, I, I think that may be part of it. 
just one quick addition to that. The um, so machine learning is a really exciting, a really exciting time at the moment. Um, there's lots of new methods and there's a lot of success in different tasks. And somebody who's interested in both um, mathematical modeling, machine learning, and in uh, and in language uh, it may want to preserve some flexibility if it doesn't work out. So you know, I'm a student. I'm applying somewhere for grad school. If I go to a computer science department, if language doesn't work out, I can take the same toolbox and apply it to vision. Whereas if I'm in a linguistics department, if computational linguistics doesn't work out, what am I going to switch to? Fieldwork? <laughs> Maybe. There's some really interesting people with that pedigree, actually. There are, yeah. But I think it's easier for maybe for people to, uh, to imagine. Um, I mean, there's sort of within the machine learning community, there's a lot of people who are sort of mercenary about what tasks they apply uh, their toolbox to. And maybe that's part of the problem. It's seeing all these mercenaries at ACL. Uh, but it does make a computer science department sort of an attractive place to be. Uh, if you don't get the academic job, you can go and you know work on any number of interesting things in industry, uh, but, but not, not just language. Picking up on the mercenaries at ACL thing, I want to address Chris's point, which I think got a little bit lost here, about yeah, let's why, aren't, yeah, why yeah. aren't linguists paying attention. And I think a little bit of that, just like the NLP people tell me, well, your syntax classes are impenetrable. I'm not going to take it. I think that a lot of the ML literature I mean, there's, you know, yeah, it's full of equations, but that's actually not the bigger problem. The bigger problem is all of the overclaiming. So you can't really find the signal for the noise. Everybody who says, you know, in the introduction talks about what babies do and then goes on to something that's got absolutely nothing to do with what babies do. <laughs> How am I going to find the papers that are actually interesting? Were you talking about linguistics or computational computer yeah. science? <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Uh, we should probably wrap up. Um, but so uh, we're going to keep doing this. We had, a, we had a very productive business meeting the other night. Please join the, the Skill Society for Computation and Linguistics mailing list if you'd like to keep up with it. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be sending out more information. I'll put everyone who was on the Easy Chair group, I'll put you all on that, and then you can get yourself off the mailing list if you need to. Um, I want to thank Coral Huto, Andrew Lamont, and Sulin Blagett, uh, students at UMass who did a lot of work in this. And um, we'll see you next year.